Greetings, and welcome to another Curiosities episode. We've just put a wrap on the CRISPR series, finishing off with our third paper, and now it's time to just dive into the Curiosities and talk about just some CRISPR stuff in general and uh, what we thought was pretty cool about uh, some of the papers we read. I'm Luke. And I'm Hunter. And you're listening to Epistem, a show where we explore papers in STEM fields and let you know what they're all about. All right, let's get into it. After reading the papers for the CRISPR series, uh, we realized that there's two main uh, topics that we'd like to go over in this Curiosities. Uh, those would happen to be biomimicry and the ethics of uh, CRISPR. So, starting off, I'll um, just dive right into biomimicry. So, in case you didn't know, uh, biomimicry, uh, in essence, is machines or uh, just products in general that are made to mimic something in nature whether it be trees whether it be animals uh, just some kind of process or uh, design that it mimics or matches the features of a uh, of something found in nature so um, I did talk about a book in one of the previous episodes and that book would be Biomimicry, Innovation Inspired by Nature by Janine Benyes. This gives an in-depth dive into biomimicry, how I, and it's also how I personally got interested in the subject about three years ago. So they go over a few really great and uh, I think interesting points within the book that uh, you might want to read in the future. This includes mimicking plants for photovoltaics, so solar panels, basing computing methods on the way that molecules work, even relating business fields to the workings of a forest. Really? Business? It, never never uh, thought about business as a possible application of biomimicry. A common application that is usually referred to when talking about biomimicry uh, is the bullet train in Japan. So this is a train that has been known to be very fast and efficient and that's actually uh, mostly because of the biomimicry of the design itself. The aerodynamics of the uh, train and the design of the nose are actually based on a kingfisher. And how a kingfisher pierces water is how the train itself pierces air. I feel like most applications I've seen of biomimicry have to do with aerodynamics. Like birds and fish, uh, the way they move through water. You look at a lot of like, gliders and stuff kind of look like birds in a way or uh... yep. um I, i'd agree with that i mean it makes sense if we're we as humans don't know how to fly That's uh true. why not take a little advice from nature who's been doing it for millions of years so yeah yeah although the CRISPR process actually isn't biomimicry it does run a fine line with biomimicry due to the fact that we are uh, using a biological process for the betterment of science and the betterment of what we're uh, what processes uh, humans are trying to use it for. Whereas um, biomimicry is usually basing something off of the biological mean uh, biological system. We're actually using or utilizing the uh, biological system itself, which is, I think, a fantastic thing. Like I said earlier, it's. Uh, Humans can always learn from nature. It's uh, you. They have millions of years on us, and probably millions more after us. So yeah, uh, yeah they've been evolving, and why not just learn from uh, from their processes? Right. Yeah. As you saw in the uh, the third CRISPR episode, uh, CRISPR was related and used in a biomimicry method uh, to fight against FPGA hardware trojans. Another application that is not necessarily feasible right now, but uh, maybe in the future, utilizing CRISPR-related uh, methods to actually pinpoint audio within a certain podcast, a movie, or uh, some other means. So being able to track and find an exact point within that, uh, that set form of media might be a, uh, a good common use application and could po people could possibly uh, code a uh, software that's actually somewhat based on the CRISPR method of finding that. Yeah, I can see that. And C, 
this isn't biomimicry, but I hope that CRISPR continues onward and continues to help the medical field because like we've talked about in previous episodes, it is very beneficial and can help with uh, lots of different disease fighting, whether it be cancer, whether it be um, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, there are many different diseases and many different ailments that can be treated or looked into the um, better treatment of it based on CRISPR methods and CRISPR processes within the human body. And uh, moving on from that, we are going to have a short break, and when we come back from the break, we'll be talking about the ethics of CRISPR. Yeah, so moving from that into the ethical implications of CRISPR... Uh, the nature of the CRISPR process involves modifying genetic material. So if science can master a process to change genetics, who knows how far that could go, really. I'd say we're probably more limited by our understanding of genetics than what we could do with it with CRISPR. What pieces of DNA specifically do you need to modify to change a particular trait or some biological process? That's kind of the big mystery is genetics are so complicated and just a small change could have implications all over the place. You know, it's not so, I guess linear might be the right word. It's not a guarantee that one gene is the only thing defining a particular trait, or that changing that gene would change just that trait. It could, it could have other changes in your body, which may not be ideal or desired. In the past, CRISPR has been used to heal diseased cells, uh, to kill antibiotic-resistant bacteria, to improve crop yields, all kinds of what most people would consider positive things. But the traits of any living thing are determined by that thing's genetics. And let's talk about traits for a minute. An acquired trait won't pass on to your offspring. The classic example is the ability to play piano. If you practice and become a master pianist, that doesn't mean that your offspring will be good uh, piano players, but maybe you do pass on a distinguishing sense of hearing, because that could be something that's defined by your genetics. So taking that a step further, if your genetics do pass on to your offspring, that means you could even pass on genetics that you've modified to your offspring, no longer leaving it completely up to chance which genetics you pass on to your children. You can probably already see where this starts to get kind of morally ambiguous, but luckily only DNA from particular cells can be transmitted to offspring. If you modify genes in your organ tissue, whether it be to fight off a disease or uh, just for fun, I guess, those changes won't pass on. That would be kind of in the same category as an acquired trait. And that's because uh, most of the cells in your body are what's called somatic cells. In fact, the only cells that aren't somatic are the ones in egg and sperm cells. So edited genes in egg and sperm cells will be passed on to offspring. Alternatively, genes edited while still in an embryo state could be passed on. You could theoretically use CRISPR technology to alter the genetics of your offspring before they were ever born, making them taller, stronger, who knows what else. This is starting to border on the concept of eugenics, in which a population is, for lack of a better word, edited over generations to keep desirable traits and weed out non-desirable traits. Yep. And uh, eugenics hasn't been uh, looked at too happily uh, by right. people. <laughs> yeah, it's it's often associated with Nazis, I think. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Nazis did a lot of testing for um, eugenic base, like on babies and stuff, to see how um, how they could edit genes. Yeah, that's um, it's kind of part of the whole Aryan race thing. You know, yep. It's kind of a perfect example of eugenics, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a whole rabbit hole we could go down with eugenics. And there are a lot of uh, good episodes by other podcasts and good articles about it so if you're interested in that I would uh, encourage you to look that up on your own it may sound kind of like a distant future that that technology is is available but it's not really so in China in 2018 gene editing was used to genetically modify two twin human embryos to make them less likely to contract HIV this technology is very new and honestly it's kind of scary with how powerful it could be Uh, but that's probably why using gene editing on embryonic sperm or egg cells is currently illegal in most countries. But it begs the question of, will it ever be available to the public, and under what circumstances? Would we be able to trust ourselves with technology like that? It's an interesting thing to consider. Maybe in the near future we'll be able to use preserved DNA of extinct species to bring them back for the dead. It kind of is like Jurassic Park in a sense. You know, not so sure that's a future that we we should pursue. I mean, they've had a... 
what, five movies telling us not to do it. Basically, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, and books. <laughs> well, that concludes another episode of Epstem. Uh, thank you for listening to this episode and the previous CRISPR series. This is the conclusion of that series. We hopefully will uh, go back into the biological field, whether it be CRISPR or other uh, other things in the future. But uh, thank you for listening, and hopefully you'll stay tuned for our uh, next episode. It's going to be going into the neuroscience field. Very interesting stuff. We even got to meet up with a professor for this one. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to make. Yeah. Well, as always, uh, if you ever have any questions or just want to give us feedback in general, you can email us at epistem.pod at gmail.com. Also, if you really enjoyed the show, you can uh, donate to our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash epistem. Also, uh, if you want to give us a like and follow on whatever your, um, your mode of uh, listening is, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. And make sure to check out our, uh, our Instagram page. It is epistempodcast or epi.stem.